Um, we're going to move to the next presentation by Dr. Taran Chen. He has extensive background in the acoustic, mechanical engineering, and geophysics. And he's done many multidisciplinary projects. He has 14 years of work experience working at Halliburton and Shell. He's been working in the area of sensor hardware and algorithm development and managing multi-million dollar seismic projects. He has years of experience. Uh, he graduated with a PhD degree from MIT in 2008. Dr. Chen, all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kami, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. I think, uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. First up, I, I would like to thank Jijun uh, for inviting us to um, give a talk in this workshop. I uh, really appreciate that. So uh, I'm Ken Ren, and uh, co-founder and CEO of Sensor uh, Arrow. So today I'm uh, excited to introduce our low-cost autonomous and real-time uh, permanent source and receiver system for uh, CCS, uh, particularly for CO2 plume tracking. So uh, here just uh, uh, as a content of this talk, first I will um, just give a one-page overview of the current CO2 uh, storage challenge. Um, and uh, then uh, discuss about uh, our um, kind of low cost remote operate uh, uh, seismic source and uh, uh, receivers. And uh, then uh, discuss how we apply this system uh, for uh, CO2 pro uh, migration monitoring and then end up uh, wrap up with uh, Q&A. So uh, first, uh, let me just uh, briefly discuss about the current challenges for the CO2 uh, storage. Uh, it's really need a low cost technology in every aspect. Um, so as we all know that uh, uh, injecting a capture a CO2 and the storage of them will not make money. So the only incentive for people to doing it, it it's through a tax bracket. And only 20 to 25 of tax credit to go to uh, carbon storage while you have a 70 to 75% of money will be paid for uh, uh, carbon uh, capture. And the rest of 5% is on the CO2 uh, transportation. So um, let's say the, in the very uh, optimistic uh, scenarios that with $80, $80 per metric ton 45Q uh, credit, for instance, that only $20 will go to carbon storage. So per metric ton, those including site characterization with very expensive three seismic survey, um, class six uh, well uh, injection well drillings, and uh, also a very expensive um, CO2 injection facility operations. And the last including we call the um, uh, MMV or MRV basically is uh, monitoring to make sure that the CO2 can be uh, safely stored in, into the ground for a long time. So uh, as we know, it's been mandated by the government uh, to, uh, to monitor the CO2 uh, you know, storage uh, to mitigate the risk of the potential CO2 uh, uh, leakage uh, that's uh, in long run. And as you can see from this uh, left uh, figure, um, let me go to my last point. Okay. So there are a, a few different ways that the injected CO2 can uh, find its path to leak out to the surface. Uh, one way is go through um, the existing uh, fault and uh, um, or through the abandoned um, deep, uh, uh, wells, or through uh, the fractures that actually is generated due to the CO2 uh, injections. So uh, it needs to be uh, have this uh, uh, MMV in place to make sure that all this uh, you know, stored CO2 uh, can stay in underground for a long time. So, so currently, uh, it's about two to three dollars uh, per metric tons uh, uh, spend on this uh, MM, uh, V or MRV, which is kind of unsustainable. You can see in an ideal case with eighty dollar uh, 
uh, 45Q matrix, um, that's $20 go to the entire carbon storage. So the entire MMV uh, already have a, a 15%, 10 to 15%, which is definitely not sustainable. And uh, here's our objective um, is to develop a low cost system that can bring down uh, this cost significantly. Um, our goal is at least to bring down to reduce to $1 uh, um, MMV monitoring cost per metric ton or even goes to 50 cents, which is about uh, um, you know, 5% um, or 2.5% of the entire carbon storage cost. And I think that is a, a more sustainable way for the monitoring. So based on that, so we've been uh, developing uh, active uh, permanent source and receivers for CO2 uh, plume trackings and for induced seismicity monitoring in order to meet those uh, the requirement of uh, MMV or MRV. So let me first start with uh, a permanent source. We are actually working together with another company called uh, GPUSA. So basically, as you can see on this uh, uh, left figure, um, there we ha uh, have a two uh, eccentric motor is sitting on top of what we call the helical piles. So this helical piles is uh, uh, length is varying between 10 to 100 feet, depends on the actual requirement. So you can see the two eccentric uh, 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 you know, mass motors, they are rotated in uh, opposite direction. So all this motion in the horizontal is canceled and then it's generated a pure a vertical motion. So it's similar to a traditional vibe size. So uh, I think uh, the Differentiation is that you can see this motors actually is rigidly connected with a helical pipe. So basically uh, this source is not a generated vibration on the surface um, and actually is generated um, at uh, you know, up to 100 feet uh, depths. So this will uh, avoid a lot of uh, energy is being attenuated, uh, attenuated uh, from the surface layers when, uh, when you operate the uh, traditional uh, vibe size or other type of a source. So this figure shows that as uh, one of the, the picture for the actual uh, deployment. So two uh, motors are, are anchored in a steel plate and uh, in the field uh, with uh, chloro, uh, mini chloro uh, tractors uh, with about uh, 20,000 to 50,000 uh, torque. So you can easily uh, install uh, this uh, source uh, within 45 minutes. So there are as I mentioned, uh, there are a bunch of um, features for this uh, source. Uh, first is I have uh, off, you know, offset mass rotated along uh, axle. So it's generated um, a variable or, or a fixed sweep of frequency between zero to uh, 100 Hertz. And uh, uh, it can be remote uh, controlled uh, through the internet, which means that um, that is also our ultimate goal is to acquire uh, seismic data without a single seismic crew in the field. And uh, we can uh, you know, operate remotely uh, from, uh, for instance, a Houston office and actually the, the actual field crew uh, could be uh, worldwide. And uh, it's uh, produced uh, a linear vibration similar to uh, a traditional vibe size as showing on this figure. So we can do and uh, with uh, you know, a, a source controller that also you know, typically you can see from a uh, vibe size. So it can produce uh, you know, a linear um, up sweep or down sweep or even nonlinear uh, sweep. And uh, I think the most important features, as I uh, emphasize across uh, this entire uh, presentation, is that it's going to be low cost. Since that most of the parts, you can see the helical piles, the motors, they are all uh, has been uh, borrowed from other industries and uh, been massive produced. So on one, uh, one end, the cost is really uh, uh, you know, effectively, and also uh, they are really uh, reliable since they have been used by other industry for many, many years. 
And uh, um, one thing that we are currently is working on is uh, instead of using uh, agreed powers, uh, 480 watts volts, we are switching to uh, solar and electric power, which uh, give us a great uh, flexibility to deploy um, this source to anywhere we want. And uh, uh, its source monitors. Uh, another unique feature is that uh, this helical pipe actually is hollow. Uh, we can put uh, one of our, uh, our sensors instead of on the surface actually is down to the, uh, the tip. So to monitor uh, the, uh, the each the uh, source signatures. So compared to the traditional way to do uh, cross correlation to remove the source signature uh, with a synthetic waveform, we are actually using the actual source waveforms um, so it's easy to install. It's, uh, it's uh, took about forty five minutes to uh, to installation, and it's generate eleven thousand pound at hundred hertz. Uh, of course, um, it will be. It is much difficult to generate a larger uh, force at a low frequency. So that's why we come up with uh, the idea of the nonlinear sweep. We tend to uh, run uh, this type of source at low frequencies uh, with uh, more times. So I hope we can put more energy into the ground. And uh, the currently the, uh, the two motors is about 300 pounds. So uh, we are not relying on, on it to hold. Uh, uh, we actually uh, using the uh, helical pliers to uh, hold down uh, the entire uh, two coupling uh, with the, so uh, the, uh, the soil. And uh, uh, currently it's require we are uh, uh, about uh, 10,048 uh, uh, batteries to run this entire uh, system. So uh, next, I just want to quickly go through uh, our autonomous uh, six component sensor. As you can see on uh, this uh, figure, um, so we have basically, uh, we have uh, six component sensors. I will explain in uh, just the next few slides. Uh, uh, all in captured in this uh, cylinder shape uh, uh, cylinder. And uh, the sensors is powered by uh, lithium batteries and uh, we use a solar panel to charge the lithium battery. And on top of it uh, with uh, uh, four, uh, we call three one antennas, including GPS, 4G and Wi-Fi. So all the sensor data uh, will be real time transmitted to the cloud and be processed. So this figures shows actually uh, deployment for one of our sensors in California. So I will come back to provide more details about this uh, installation. So our sensors actually including uh, six uh, component motion sensor. So basically major three axis accelerations and three axis uh, rotations. And uh, on top of it, uh, we also uh, have a three component magnetometer, uh, which provides a precise sensor orientations. And uh, all the sensors are hermetically sealed uh, for harsh environment. And uh, you can see uh, our sensors uh, has a very uh, a small size and a lightweight. So actually in our past uh, few deployment, we put, uh, we load the sensors just into our uh, personal SUVs and uh, to, uh, for deployment. And uh, it, it takes about 30 minutes to uh, deploy sensor. Um, it depends on where you put the sensors. So for in Texas, uh, we also need to put a cattle fence to protect um, uh, the uh, sensors from uh, from cattle. So that maybe add another one hour's um, uh, installation time. Uh, but I think yeah, it doesn't matter too much for CCS permanent uh, monitoring. And as I mentioned before, it can be flexibly uh, deployed um, either permanent or temporary with a very uh, small surface print and uh, 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 minimal uh, HSE uh, exposure during the sensor installations. So it's powered by uh, solar and a battery. So once we deployed uh, this sensor, uh, we uh, do not need to go back uh, to do uh, um, any maintenance. All the firmwares will be updated all over the air. So uh, I think the only thing is maybe we need to revisit the installation side is to swap the battery. Uh, typically they have a three years uh, uh, life uh, time. 
and we use 4G as a main uh, communications to transmit data in real time. In some of the uh, scenarios that is uh, uh, very poor or no uh, 4G coverage, so we use uh, uh, Wi-Fi communications plus a uh, uh, Starlink uh, to uh, transmit the data, which is developed by uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, company, uh, SpaceX. So uh, all the data are GPS stand and, uh, and also um, again, the most important feature is a low cost. So compared to traditional uh, size small meters uh, or uh, our cost is more than one order magnitude lower. And uh, for our next generation uh, sensor, we will also uh, uh, include a, a very high precision uh, GPS uh, unit called RTK uh, to provide a sub-centimeter uh, accuracy for subsidence. So this could uh, potentially uh, as a calibration point uh, for uh, in-star image to try to capture the uh, surface de uh, deformations uh, before and after CO2 injection. Um, so um, we got uh, many of the questions. People say, hey, your sensors looks nice, but how does it compare to uh, traditional uh, seismometers? So fortunately, yes, we are being invited by our three operators in Permian to compare uh, our uh, sensors side by side with uh, more traditional, much more expensive uh, seismometers. Um, I, I know that some of um, our audience actually is from the Texas net. So you may say that this is actually um, a state, Texas state owned seismic uh, network actually managed by uh, uh, UT Austin, uh, the bureau. And uh, uh, they are using uh, about, uh, you know, 60K uh, uh, seismometers. So, and uh, we deploy our sensor specifically uh, six feet away from uh, this we call the uh, Texas net or public uh, seismic stations. And uh, to compare, we have um, been recorded more than 20 induced seismicity locally. And we are uh, looking for the data release. So all the, uh, the events, the data are highly consistent with uh, this very high sensitive and uh, expensive uh, seismometers. So here I just show you examples from uh, a month ago, uh, magnitude 7.6 earthquake in Mexico, which is about more than uh, 1300 kilometers away. And uh, so we plot uh, the three component accelerations on top of each other. So the black curve is our sensor data and the red curve is a Texas net uh, accelerometers and uh, and the blue is a Texas seismometers, which measures the velocity being converted to acceleration. So you can see that the three curves uh, follows um, uh, against each other very well. So this we are really happy about is that, that our technologies just been proven to be as good as traditional, but more, much more expensive uh, seismometers uh, in terms of recording induced seismicities and the natural earthquake. So uh, another question so we, we've been also being asked a lot is regarding to uh, why you want to develop a six component sensor. So here is one of the reasons why we want to uh, uh, have these sensors uh, uh, in our uh, uh, you know, system. So uh, compared to the traditional uh, you know, 3D uh, size more meters or 3D uh, no system that measuring uh, the translational motions like velocity and accelerations over uh, X, Y, Z. We also have a three component uh, uh, rotational sensor. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, measuring the airplane pitch, yaw and roll. So uh, from this uh, equations, actually, uh, it's as a function of the velocity, it's as a function of um, accelerations and the, uh, over z direction and acceleration uh, uh, rotations of x and y. So basically, you can calculate a single point velocity profile uh, 
as a function of a frequency, which is we call refer to dispersion curve. So um, we did uh, this uh, experiment. Uh, we did uh, dig a trench. We put uh, uh, two uh, tanks. One is filled uh, up with water. One is empty to simulate high and low velocity zone. We put back the soil and we put uh, our six component sensors on top of it. So we use a hammer to generate a seismic uh, uh, waveforms as showing in this figure. And uh, using these equations to calculate uh, the velocities uh, across this line, as you clearly indicate uh, um, the low uh, uh, the low velocity zone and the uh, high velocity, uh, velocity zones actually um, represented by the water fuel tank and empty tank. So why we want to do that? Because it can be used to uh, for the shallow uh, weather and rare profilings. And uh, we know that uh, there are lots of variations in the shallow weather and layers, and it could, uh, you know, uh, cost lots of uh, uh, noise to the actual 4D signal. So um, I will go back to this part uh, in the next uh, few slides. Okay, so before um, that is our source and receiver system, before I really jump to how to utilize this system uh, for CO2 plume tracking, I first just want to mention that uh, regarding to the induced seismicity monitoring before and during the CO2, which is uh, very important. Uh, so, uh, so before you want to really select your uh, CO2 storage side and uh, drilling an expensive class six wells, you want to make sure that there is no background uh, uh, seismicity or induced seismicity. So typically those, if you record any of those, it means that it's you have either have active existing fault, which could potentially provide a pass uh, uh, away for CO2 to leak out. So since our sensors, uh, receiver sensors are working 24 seven, uh, it can continue some monitoring whether there is a background induced seismicity and also during the injections, so any, anything that uh, the high pressure fluid you inject into the river, there always some potential risk. You could, uh, um, you know, frack uh, the cap rock and also provide a fractures for CO2 uh, uh, to leak out. So we also provide this real time, you know, monitoring during the CO2 injection. Okay, so uh, next, uh, let's uh, talk about how we utilize our low cost system for CO2 uh, plume tracking. So before going into our method, I want to first quickly review what's the, the existing method there. So as you can see, um, so one of the method that use, use we call DAS uh, uh, VSP uh, with, uh, with fiber uh, cables or, or geophones installed in the well. And then uh, you have a seismic source generate reflection images. So then you can use this to track the CO2 uh, plume. I think it's a, uh, it's a, Cost effective regarding to the uh, the receiver part because the DAS cables typically uh, will be a fiber cable will be installed for other purposes such as monitoring temperature. Uh, however, you still need to go to the traditional um, you know four D seismic processing uh, to migrate the data and generate images, which that part um, uh, is not uh, very cost effectively. And I think as another big uh, issues with this type of method, it's only provide a very limited CO2 plume tracking ranges. And uh, beyond the certain ranges that is, uh, you cannot uh, track uh, the CO2 plumes with, uh, with uh, uh, sensors in the hole. So then um, we have to go back to uh, a traditional, you know, 3D, 4D, uh, seismic business. So we uh, track the entire CO2 plumes with very dense and uh, surf, uh, surface source and receivers. And you can see that uh, it's very expensive. And uh, you have to the, not only just uh, the acquisition, uh, but also the data processing. You need to go to very complicated, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, processing. Uh, and uh, also, because it's so expensive, uh, I think uh, most of the operators can only um, afford to do uh, every few years. So basically you are get uh, a few snapshot of the CO2 plume uh, images on the ground. And even you know that by comparing uh, this year's CO2 uh, image compared to maybe next five years, you only know that the CO2 
rooms that maybe expand from A to B, and you don't know how it's expand from A to B. So it's very difficult for you to predict for next five years how the CO2 plume gonna propagate. And also, um, let's say the worst case scenario is the CO2 plume uh, start to migrate uh, upwards instead of horizontal. You will not know it until five years later you acquire this, uh, this uh, 4D image again. So here is a method we propose is to using a permanent uh, or semi-permanent source and a receiver uh, with a few uh, uh, a few receivers to only track the CO2 plume front instead of the entire CO2 uh, plumes compared to traditional 3D uh, for the uh, seismic survey. So since that, uh, if we know the locations of the CO2 plume front, we already know that there must be filled with a CO2 between the injection well and your front. Why you want to spend uh, the majority of the money onto some information you already know. Uh, there are as, some other mer uh, merits to, to using these acquisitions is that uh, uh, instead of you uh, have a dense sampling over space, is actually we acquire uh, this type of survey on a daily basis. So we have a very dense sampling over time. So and doing the stacking to uh, to improve the signal to noise ratios, and and also you can see since we don't have many source receiver pairs, we are not doing a very expensive uh, migration uh, and working in the image domain to generate uh, the CO2 plume images. We directly working on the data domain. It's only require very uh, basic processing. It can be automated and it's a very low cost and it's, uh, it's autonomous and continuous. So um, at current stage, you may come up with uh, um, you know, a, a question is that, okay, since it's, it's nice to keep tracking the CO2 plume front, but how I, I still want to get the entire CO2 plume uh, images, how can we do that? So that is, the answer is to move the entire acquisition system along with the CO2 plume expansion in every few months. So at the beginning, when your CO2 plume is, uh, you know, near very small, uh, close to the wearable, you are positioning your sense uh, source and receivers just to focus on the, uh, the regions that are close to the wearable. As the CO2 plume um, being continues, uh, being continue inject and expand, you move your entire uh, acquisition systems along with the CO2 plume. So that's and on. So you, then you can get the entire uh, CO2 plume uh, images. And, and also uh, this is just along certain directions. You can deploy these systems in uh, uh, multiple azimuths to uh, track the CO2 plume in 3D. Um, of course, this uh, permanent source and a receiver um, uh, acquisition to track the very small, tiny reservoir changes is not a novel idea. Actually, in 20, uh, 2002, uh, CGG uh, proposed this call, uh, you know, size uh, movie concept is to track a very uh, subtitle variations uh, on the uh, reservoirs. And you can see they're using uh, the travel time difference to, uh, to monitor a gas uh, a storage reservoir. And uh, you can see that uh, the travel time uh, difference uh, between when you have uh, injecting the uh, natural gas storage or your extractions uh, could be, uh, you know, small than one milliseconds. And uh, they're using uh, this type of uh, permanent source and a receiver be able to uh, differentiate uh, very tiny uh, changes or, or, or over the travel times refraction travel time. And also um, there is another uh, DOE sponsored uh, project uh, finished uh, in 2015 by ERC and uh, uh, with, uh, with different uh, uh, seismic source, instead of using uh, you know, our permanent seismic source, they have a wet job source. Uh, instead of using our permanent uh, receivers, they have a, you know, a portable node system. So every few months, they will send people to um, harvest the data. And uh, here is the injection wells. Um, then people start to, uh, by the way, uh, this report is for uh, enhanced oil recovery. So people injecting CO2 uh, to, uh, to to, to improve the oil um, uh, production. So, and uh, 
but exactly the same geometries. So you have a single source and a receiver and just one trace as uh, we call it is a CDP common uh, depth point. So when um, the uh, there is no uh, CO2 plume propagate at this particular point. So every, you know, every week there are, you know, generate seismic waves, of course, ideally case there's uh, no changes uh, on the trace since that the CO2 uh, plumes has not uh, yet propagated to that CDP point. But one day, once the CDP, uh, uh, the CO2, uh, you know, propagate through uh, this, uh, you know, common uh, depth point, you suddenly, you saw the changes over um, the trace, uh, you know, the uh, difference between the baseline and the monitoring line. So using this way, you can get a very good, uh, you know, 40 uh, signal examples. Um, However, they are also listed, uh, by the way, you can download uh, um, this uh, the entire report through this uh, uh, link, which uh, you know, can be sent out uh, later. And uh, also in this uh, report, they indicate that they always, not always get a good 4D signal to be able to track the CO2 uh, plume uh, propagations. Uh, for some time, um, you can see they get this, uh, I think, uh, uh, close to 50% they get this ambiguous uh, CO2 uh, 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 for these uh, example. And um, there are lots of many of uh, uh, factors contributed to this uh, ambiguous 4D uh, signals. One is that uh, they are using a wet job source. So basically um, the source uh, that Every time you using uh, accelerate a uh, wet job uh, onto the ground and uh, and generate seismic waves, you are kind of uh, digging uh, the source in uh, self into a hole. That's create lots of source variations, not just the uh, the medium changes due to the CO two plume, and also there are lots of tremendous of the weather layer changes, as you can see on this uh, uh, compared to the the monitor lines compared to the baselines that tremendous changes on the shallow uh, 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 layers, so uh, which is a need to be accounted before you can uh, get a good signal. That is how our uh, six component sensor for velocity profiling uh, play a rule to try to correct the uh, shallow weather layer change. And also the sensors have been uh, constantly moved out of the ground to harvest the data. And for us, um, then um, our systems will not have this issue. So basically we solved uh, um, the existing pro, uh, uh, issues with uh, three uh, solutions. There is no source variations. Uh, each of our source will be uh, recorded by uh, the sensors actually placed at the tip of the source. And the weathering layer changes will be profiled, uh, profiled on a daily base. And then uh, we never need to move our sensors uh, out of the ground to harvest the data. And all the data will be uh, transmitted to the uh, uh, cloud in real time. So uh, um, our current project, uh, we have deployed our sensors uh, in a uh, uh, 500 uh, acre win, uh, 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 vineyard to test this whole uh, concept. And uh, you can see that we deployed uh, nine sensors along um, two azimuth directions. Uh, so these directions is, uh, have about 2,000 feet with five sensors. And uh, um, we have another deploy um, a perpendicular lines. So it, this uh, image is a little bit uh, uh, distorted due to uh, the, uh, from the Zhong uh, image. And, but it's a straight lines with uh, offset uh, up to uh, 3,500 uh, 3, uh, feet. So, and uh, we have a permanent source will be installed uh, at this red dot, which is a, a, um, a AV, uh, uh, RV uh, park provide uh, 480 volts uh, uh, AC uh, power. Of course, this sensor is, uh, you know, is um, a little bit uh, in proportional to its size. And uh, so we will use this uh, testing site to um, answer this question, is, um, how deep our source can penetrate? Uh, what's the signal you know, attenuations um, uh, with offset? And uh, what's the uh, optimal sweep uh, in order to 
get the desired uh, depths? And is there any ground loss uh, noise across uh, to the different uh, receivers? And, uh, um, and also we plan to test our solar uh, solutions with listening battery versus uh, AC uh, really perform some uh, endurance test. And so please keep tuned and uh, hope that we will install um, our permanent sensors uh, uh, in next uh, two weeks. Uh, the nine sensors, uh, receiver sensors actually uh, has already been installed in September. Uh, we even able to uh, record a, a recent 5.1 uh, magnitude earthquake in San Jose, which is about uh, 250 kilometers uh, from the uh, site. And, uh, and also the reason we want to select this site is it's about 20 miles away with a very famous uh, San Angeles fault. So hope that we were able to record uh, 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 many, many uh, um, small magnitude earthquake. Um, so um, I, I think uh, to summary, so basically we provide a holistic uh, autonomous monitoring solutions uh, with a permanent uh, autonomous low cost six component uh, motion sensor uh, plus autonomous uh, uh, seismic source. So there are a few things that we are able to achieve with our current system is first is doing the side correct uh, characterization with a passive induced seismic um, uh, Monitoring, um, and on the other side, we can uh, with this active source, we can do a, a velocity profiling on a daily basis to really account for uh, the weather uh, layering changes, and then uh, we can you know, provide other, uh, you know, functions, including site monitoring with the surface uh, and the VSP images using our permanent source. And, and more importantly, we can uh, do in this type of uh, daily based uh, seismic uh, processing to provide a, to a real time track the CO2 plumes. Of course, I, I don't know how many audience are from, uh, you know, the geophysics uh, background. Um, this processing will probably is the most boring, uh, 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 you know, seismic processing. So, it's, so every day is just to compare the difference with previous days is to see, yeah, if there are any uh, reflections, uh, dif uh, amplitude difference or travel time difference. Uh, to summarize this presentation, so basically the subsurface storage of the CO2 need to uh, increase rapidly to meet uh, the goals set by uh, Paris Agreement. And, uh, you know, seismic uh, method can track the CO2 migrations, uh, and which is already, uh, you know, been proven by, uh, you know, all this previous uh, technology. Um, since that uh, the only incentive um, to, uh, capture and store the CO2 uh, is from the tax credit. The solutions must be low cost and low emissions. So based on that, we propose our uh, sparse source and receiver acquisitions uh, with a CDP uh, mapping uh, method and a velocity uh, inversion. Um, I think this concluded, uh, concluded my talk today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I had one question from uh, a few days ago. We just uh, talked about uh, some, uh, there is a, uh, uh, like a, uh, a set of several wells and you know, in Middle East, uh, it's, uh, uh, there is a heavy sand. It's uh, actually, it's uh, flowing sand uh, uh, surface. And the, the sand, I, I guess, could be as deep as uh, maybe, uh, like uh, several decades uh, uh, meters mm -hmm. so it, will that influence uh, the you need uh, like a dig deeper to to deploy your sensor on what would you uh okay so basically you you are asking a question about uh, the source penetration right the we we need to generate a you know sufficient a stronger source to be able to uh you know go down to two to three kilometer steps and then uh, receive the reflected sec uh, signals back to those uh, reservoirs to be able to uh, track the co2 plume so the current answer is um we don't know until we done the experiment in uh, in California, but based on our previous experience, because this source um, already been deployed in various uh, places, including um, uh, CMC, um, I think a CAMI, uh, 
uh, Carbon Management Canada and Lawrence Berkeley, we see very strong signals um, of this source can generate uh, down to you know one to two kilometers uh, depths. So it's just a matter of is, uh, how much you know time we need to sweep and um, to be able to see a, a good signal. So that is will be our uh, next uh, step, and also we probably need to design some we call the uh, nonlinear uh, sweep uh, tends to sweep more uh, in low frequency uh, range to generate to be able to propagate uh, more energy down to the ground. You can see the high frequency range is easy to generate uh, strong signals uh, at 100 hertz, for instance. That's um, the source. The sources can generate uh, more than uh, 11,000 pounds of the force, and also pretty. Uh, uh, don't forget about this. Uh, since uh, that source is directly rigid connected to the helical pipe, it can direct transfer the energy, the vibration from the surface to 100 feet uh, deep. It will not uh, suffer the significant energy loss compared to the you know, traditional vibe size. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there will be more questions, but uh, the, due to the time, I will contact you later on. Yeah. Okay. There is a Thank question you. by Dr. Delshot. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Chen, a very interesting talk. Uh, so the question I have is, can you directly use your uh, sensors and equipment for hydrogen uh, storage and uh, following the plume of hydrogen? Um, yes, that is also the plan because you can see that this method actually already proven by CGG. It can really track in, you know, sub milliseconds travel time difference, which is for a gas uh, storage monitoring. So I think, yes, the potential uh, is there. We just need to find a pilot project and approve this technology. Okay, thank you.